Hello, lovelies. Welcome to the Fat Joy Podcast, where we talk each week about how to flourish in an anti-fat world. I'm Sophia Apostle, a fat professional coach who loves talking to other fat people about what it's like to live within oppressive systems that marginalize our bodies and how we still dare to have the audacity and courage to reach towards our collective liberation and embrace our joy. Please know this is an adult content podcast, so there will be swears. We will be talking about harms we've experienced, and we will be rebelling against weight stigma, diet culture, fat phobia, ableism, racism, etc. You can get more Fat Joy goodness, including how you can support the podcast through my newsletter at fatjoy.substack.com. And for episode transcripts, book reviews, and show notes, head to the Fat Joy website at fatjoy.life. I am so glad you're here. Enjoy this episode. Hello, lovelies. Welcome back to the Fat Joy podcast. I'm Sophia, as you know, and I am here today with someone who I followed for quite some time, someone whose name I've known for quite some time, and I feel really lucky to talk to her. I am with Roz the Diva. Hi, Roz. What's going on, Sophia? Nice to see you. <laughs> I'm oh, I'm just, I'm a little, I... I didn't fangirl out when we were talking before I hit record, but now I hit record. Now I'm kind of fangirling. So pardon my stutter. You've been around and influencing in all the ways and doing such good work for a while. And I just am so excited to dive in to the work that you do in the world and how you create spaces that help and heal people, especially their relation to movement and exercise. And yeah, we're going to dive right in. So why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are? Sure. So I'm 39. I'm from Brooklyn, New York. Um, I am a fitness entrepreneur. So that just is a nice way of being vague and deciding what that means that day. Today, it means that I'm a personal trainer. I'm a pole dancing instructor um, and a future public speaker. And this, and, but fitness has been a through line in my career for the last, um, officially for the last 12 and a half years. That's how long I've been teaching people in group and in private settings. And in my past life, I was actually a career coach and I worked with black and Latino college students, um, telling them not to be drunk and cursing over the internet. And now I literally get paid. Well, I don't get paid to be drunk, but I am sometimes, um, and I'm cursing and naked on the internet. So there you go. <laughs> That's why I supposed to do. I love it. You. So do you feel <laughs> if you were to be career counseled now, what would the advice be that you would give yourself? I think I would, I think I wouldn't change much about what I did. I think I stuck to my guns, even when... I had my back up against the wall. And when people asked me to be the more polite and palatable version of myself, um, I would probably remind my younger self, like, it's all right. You don't have to shrink yourself or make your, or dull your, dull your shine for other people. And that's been a strategy that's worked out so far. And I think hopefully it'll keep working out for me. Yeah, I have no doubt. I think I think we're craving that for people. I think so many strive to be just like some standard that's been set by some arbitrary group of people that's upheld by systemic oppression that it really I think we're really drawn to people who stand out. And I mean, like you said, you you swear and are naked on the internet. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. So let's talk about your connection, your relationship to your journey with the word fat. How do you feel about that word, Roz? Yeah, so I was thinking about this and um, I actually don't like that word. Um, I, I, am, I co-sign other people describing themselves as fat. 
and I co-sign the use of it when people are using it to um, to rewrite the narrative around that word and to reclaim it the same way that Black people have reclaimed the N-word or have attempted to mostly reclaim the N-word. Um, not saying that fat is the same as the N-word, but just in in the same vein of trying to like take the power out of that word, the negativity out of it. Um, I see some parallels in that. Um, I personally, I had to get used to, I can tolerate the word fat is where I'm at right now, is because I used to, I wouldn't be able to stand it. I wouldn't read articles with the word fat in it. I would, I would see it and I would immediately reject everything about the piece of media or article or video or statement or whatever the hell I was doing that had to do with the word fat because I just, I'm like, why would anybody want to be known as fat? Like, I don't get it. Because for me, it still has so many deep negative connotations. And, um, but I have learned, like I said, to tolerate that word. And so now I can read articles with the word titles of fat in it. And I could be on podcasts like this, like Fat Joy, and not feel like, not feel offended, but just understand that like, there's, there's people trying to do some good out here. And, you know, maybe that, I think a lot of this also stems from my internalized fat phobia, um, which I can say is still very rampant within me. As much as I would like for it not to be, to say that I'm over it and I'm above it, I'm really not. Um, when it comes to myself, other people, I'll be your biggest champion in the whole wide world. But when it comes to myself and how I feel about my body and my size, um, I'm just not there yet. Yeah, it really is a journey. I mean, I, I feel like I've been actively working on my own internalized fat phobia, anti-fatness for probably close to a decade now. And I still like it's still there. It's just so deep. It'll surprise me. I'll have a situation and I'll be like, oh, oh gosh, there it is. It's still there. <laughs> it was just like hiding under a rib or something, you know? Exactly. Well, and were you like when you were a kid, were you and what word would you use? Like I would normally say, were you a fat kid? But what's your preferred word? How would you describe your body? Bigger? Cur I usually go with plus size. Plus size. Yeah. Cool. Is what is what I end up with. Um, and I, when I was younger, um, my, my size has always been connected with my attractiveness to men because unfortunately I'm straight and attracted to men, which is really inconvenient. Um, <laughs> I, I understand. So, <laughs> shout out to the dudes out there listening. <laughs> Please go have a huddle with your team because you you guys are <laughs> you you guys are something else, boy. Yeah. But anyway, I I digress. <laughs> um, I recall in second grade when little kids start kind of talking about who's got a crush on who, like the second grade version of a crush, and it seems like. All the boys had crushes on all the girls except for me. And I thought when I was younger, I didn't attribute that to my size. I attributed it to be one of the only black kids in the school that I went to. So I thought black boy, I thought white boys didn't like black girls. And not because they were racist or something was wrong. I just didn't understand how race worked yet because I was in second grade. So I just, everybody I knew was like, black kids like black kids, white kids like white kids, and that's that's who gets married. You know, I didn't see a lot of interracial love at that point, understand what that really meant. So I thought, I, I felt rejected, and I thought it was because of my race. Now, fast forward to puberty, when I started to understand race, um, puberty is where I gained a lot of weight. So I would say I was a straight sized kid up until I was probably about 12 or 13. And then in my mind, I had gained an extraordinary amount of weight that put me in from the straight size to the plus size category. 
Um, in fact, I barely remember shopping in the junior section of clothes. I feel like I went from the highest size of kid clothes to the to like a size women's 12 immediately. I have very, very few memories of shopping in like in that teen girl section of clothing stores. And, but anyway, so once I got around puberty and the weight started coming on, I still felt rejected by men and by boys, but I was like, oh, it's not because of my race. It must be because of my size. And because I also didn't understand how size worked. And I just assumed, you know, because I was like, I know I'm not an asshole. I know, like, I have a lot of friends and I know it, I don't, the only difference between me and my friends was my size. And it was also race still at that point. But like I'd said, I would started to understand how race worked. And so race had a kind of dropped as a reason why I was getting ignored and size took its place. And so since I've been around 12 or 13, I have felt like I've been chasing the attention of the male gaze. And I felt like I've been unsuccessful as a whole in that because of my size. Now, whether or not that's I've been unsuccessful versus been successful, that's... Um, that's up for debate, I'm sure, as my therapist would say. Um, but <laughs> Yay, therapists. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Shout out to therapists. <laughs> Holy shit balls. Right? They, they're the ones out here doing the Lord's work. Yeah, it's true. Oh, it's true. Jesus. <laughs> so that's been that's been my relation to size. Um, I also want to put that out there for everyone. I know I kind of say these things casually casually like i understand the gravity of what i'm talking about about chasing that male gaze and the fact that there's always been part of me that has been has felt rejected because of that so i don't want to make light of that but i can speak about that freely because i've been thinking about it since i was 13. right yeah and that's so relatable roz i mean i've definitely grew up feeling that way. I know so many plus size people have, and it's, it's like, it's a special kind of pain, like that separation, feeling separate, feeling of it. It's, I mean, it's a way that fat people plus size people are othered, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's, 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 um, and I was very fortunate in that I was not teased, I was not mocked for my size, I wasn't bullied for it, but I did all of that to myself. So there was no, there were no external bullies. My parents were super loving, they still are super loving and super supportive. So all of this has been my own doing. And it's gotten better as I've gotten older, but we still have a lot more therapy to work through. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I really, gosh, everything you're saying is resonating. And yeah, I just, I really hear, I really hear what you're saying. At some point, did the awareness start to shift? Did you start to feel like, how did, how did you, because it feels like your mindset at some point shifted around your connection to body and body size. I mean, like you said, you spend a lot of time naked on the internet. And so how, what was that shift like? I don't know if it's a mindset shift or an attitudinal or what, or just like a fuck it all shift. I'm not sure, but like <laughs> what happened there? Yeah, I think it's, um, you know, I've got to say pole dancing has had an extraordinary effect on me in the best way possible. And pole dancing, pole dancing has not healed my body issues, but it was a kickstart to moving forward in a positive direction. And that's why, well, I've been pole dancing now for 
um, probably by the time this episode comes out, 16 years. Wow. So, yeah, it's it's wild. It's been a lot, a, a, long, a long damn time. Uh, well, and why pole dancing? Like what even, like what even had you think, oh, I should try pole dancing? Literally, it was a class on the schedule at the gym that I was going to at the time. And that is how I got started pulling. It had dance in the title. I love to dance. I have a Beyonce complex trying to get on the next Renaissance tour part two. <laughs> yes, please. That'd be amazing. Oh my gosh, I would die. So um, I was like, oh, let me try this. Why not? And I tried it and it was the absolute hardest thing I'd ever tried in my life um, athletically. And, you know, I grew up playing sports so that's that's saying a little something and um it was i was surrounded by slender people uh, mostly women not wearing a whole lot either and here i come in like basketball shorts and a big baggy t-shirt trying to work this get this pole thing going um it was the hardest thing i was sore for a week i was hungry and exhausted after class and it was love at first sight. I have been, I have not looked back since. I still remember that first class. I remember what was different about pole dancing versus other modes of exercise that I'd done was that pole dancing um, was my introduction to strength training, really. And it was, even though it's all like body weight, training and body strength which is some of the hardest kind of strength out there to master um it was it wasn't cardio and because previously also during those those younger school aged years um even though i was participating in sports and i like sports and my whole family we were all active and we still are active i never felt like I was really good at something. I could add a lot of value because I can never run fast. And I attributed, well, you can't run fast because you're too big to run fast. And I hadn't seen athletes, in particular female athletes, who looked like me, who could run fast or who could run at all. And so, and you know, so many youth sports are based in just speed, just run up and down a field and kick a ball. And that's cool if you're quick and if you're good at running and good at kicking the ball. I can kick a ball, but I can't run for shit. And so pole dancing was one of the first sports that I did that had almost nothing to do with running up and down a field. And I was like, I can... I, I don't know why I thought I could build the strength to do it, but I just, I don't know. It was so much fun. I was like, I've never had this much time. I've never had a better time failing at something athletically. So let me jump in there and do this. I love that. Yeah. Like, so, because I've, I've seen a few videos of people learning how to pole dance and it does seem like a whole lot of failure for a long time. So tell us like, oh, yeah. yeah, like what, what's it like to, to start pole dancing? What are, what are you learning? I said before we start recording, when I was thinking about, I'm so drawn to trying it and I'm so terrified of trying it. I just feel like I'm worried I would really injure myself. And so I'm curious, like if you have beginners coming to your class, like where where do we start? How do you build, start to build that strength? Like, how does it work at the beginning? Yeah, um, you're going to be trash when you start. When everyone starts, they're, they're hot garbage when you start pole dancing. So all of your fears about looking crazy, about not knowing what to do and not having the strength to pull yourself up, all of that's going to come true. Perfect. Surprise. Yeah. <laughs> But now in terms of you like falling on your head and, you know, dying, that part is, that's a little extra. So you don't have to worry about that, but everything else is going to come true. Now, 
I say that not because I want people to feel like, oh gosh, I really am going to be hot garbage, but I want people to like, to relax, like the jig is up. I know as the instructor, I know you're going to be trash. So I don't want you to have the pressure of trying to impress me with your skills. So I'm going to bust your bubble right now so we can get that over with. So now you have time to have fun. And what I've learned over the years is that giving people, letting people have that permission to fail, they end up trying a lot harder and they end up way more successful. Because it's been that fear of failure that holds so many people back from even trying. So, and it's, and it's held me back from trying too. So this is definitely like the pot and the kettle both being black as hell. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I feel like some like life lessons, this is really life lesson stuff. Yeah. It, it is definitely up there with life lessons, like trying and failing, trying and failing, trying and failing. Then you try a little bit more, you fail a little bit less, and then you fail again. And then your failures just get a little smaller each time. And pretty soon you might know what you're doing. And that's pole dancing. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> And you've been doing it for 16 years. When did you start instructing people? When did you know you wanted to go that route? I have been an instructor since February 2011. And I was fortunate to get asked to be a teacher at this brand new studio that was opening in Bedside, Brooklyn. Um, and... I got recruited to teach because the owner of the studio saw me at a local competition and saw me perform, ironically, at a performance where I thought was like garbage, but she really liked it and other people liked it. So she was like, Dara was her name, still is her name. And it was like, hey, I'm opening this pole studio. I'm opening this yoga studio. We're going to do pole dancing. Do you want to be a teacher? Do you teach? And I couldn't say yes fast enough. At that point, you know, I was almost three years in the poll and I, def I dreamed about teaching, but I didn't think that it was reality because I just didn't know there just weren't enough places and enough classes to logistically like go out and teach. Now the scene in New York um, is much different. There's a lot of opportunities to teach pole dancing compared to what there were 10, 12 years ago. But, you know, 10, 12 years ago, um, there, there was, it was very limited. So I, I thought about teaching for sure, but it was like, oh, that'd be so cool one day. But I wasn't go, I wasn't actively seeking it. And then when I did start to teach, I realized it's the greatest thing to ever happen to me. And it is the most fun aspect of pole dancing for sure it's the most satisfying it is my favorite part if i love being on stage i'm a giant ham i'm a huge extrovert i'm a leo all day so all of that you know but still if i never touch another stage again but my students did and they were out there performing that's that's everything to me mm, that's amazing and so when you started pole and you started teaching and you were still living in a plus size body, like what did you encounter challenges, resistance, assumptions people made about you because of your body? How did that go? Yeah, there was one interaction I remember in particular when I started teaching at a large a bigger, a much bigger gym where it was a chain of gyms. One of the instructors had met me during an instructor training. And she was like, you're going to go so far in this industry. You're, you know, you've got a great personality for this. 
you're a lot of fun, you know what you're doing, but no one's going to hire you if you don't lose weight. And the fear was I was never going to, I and I, I was hired at that time, but I wasn't going to get those prime time premium like Tuesday at 630 class spots, the ones that everyone goes to. Uh, the fear is that I, I wasn't going to get those because I was too big. And that companies and different gyms wouldn't want to put me in the spotlight because of my size. And it was incredibly painful to hear. Not a surprise necessarily, but definitely painful. Um, and it was one of those concern trolling things where the person meant well. And I do believe that they did mean well. Um, but the person was also of that old school mindset. Like if you don't change, no one's going to care. Basically saying like, no one is going to care about your skills and your talent unless you change how you look. And thank goodness that person was very wrong. And that's not how the story winds up. But a hundred percent, it was painful. Um, and that was really, but honestly, that's probably the only time that somebody has challenged me to my face and said that most of the criticisms that I get, um, 99% of it is online from strangers, um, it's from people who've never been in my classes, um, it really, it doesn't happen often. So I'm very fortunate. And I think that's because I'm on the smaller end of plus size where people can still kind of tolerate kind of someone my size. Um, Cause right now I'm at this point in my career, I was probably around like a size 16 ish somewhere. And even now I'm like an 18, 20, probably closer to a 20. So that's just for context for people out there. So they kind of know what I'm working with. And the comments online are wild and they don't make any sense because people will literally watch me, watch a video of me in the fucking gym working out and they'll say something to the effect that like, you're too fat to go to the, you should lose some weight first. You're too fat to be a fitness role model and i'm like bro i'm at the gym what the fuck do you think i'm doing right? i'm powerlifting 225 pounds god damn it like yeah. like <laughs> yeah and i'm like so you're mad at me because i'm fat and there but i'm also exercising and you're saying well that's still not good enough you want me to do more I'm like well what more do you want me to do and you know, personally with weight loss, it's something that I have been chasing for years and that I am I would like to lose weight, but I am extremely careful to make that an I statement and to not push that on my clients and to not push that on the people around me and to have very delicate conversations about weight and size because there are a million reasons why people are shaped the way they are. And you probably know three of those million. So shut up. <laughs> um, but honestly, the comments, the comments don't bother me. Um, and they don't bother me for a bittersweet reason. Nobody has said anything that is meaner than what I've said to myself. And that's the honest truth is no comments, not when I've been a fat black whale, not when they're like, you're bald, not when people have said like, oh, I can't believe your man lets you out the house like that. And what are you doing? What do you, it, it, none of that compares to what I have thought about myself. And so I read the comments. I read every single comment on videos that have come out. Um, and it doesn't, like I said, it doesn't bother me, um, because nothing has been worse than what I've told myself. Yeah. I think that's so true. 
for so many of us. Our own inner critic is way worse than any troll. Hello, it's Sophia, and I'm jumping into this episode to invite you to subscribe, rate, and review the Fat Joy podcast. If you've been enjoying the guests and their stories, please let the algorithms know by subscribing, giving us a five-star rating, and leaving us a review. You'll be helping raise awareness of Fat Joy because then we'll get ranked higher on the podcast charts. I mean, we're already in the top 2.5 globally, which is amazing, but I want top 1%, please. I love doing this podcast and creating the platform for guests to share their stories. So I would be so grateful if you can help me keep doing that by subscribing, rating, and leaving a review. Thank you, lovely. Okay, back to the episode. How do you, do you, do you like respond to trolls? Do you just ignore it? You just leave it on your page? Like what's your response to some of those? Or do you respond? So I, I've responded occasionally, but very seldom. And I've done it a few different ways. One, I've done like the public shaming. And sometimes that works, but most of the time it doesn't. I actually found that when I, when I responded publicly to comments, I actually had a few followers that said, you know, these are shitty comments, but we miss the positive Roz. Like we don't necessarily need, we're not necessarily here for the, like the double negativity. Right. And I was and I took that to heart and I was like, oh shit, that probably makes sense. Um, <laughs> And then number two, and but then what I've done, which has been really fascinating, is that I would DM people who had written comments and I'd ask them, minus all emotion, minus any judgment, I would literally write, why did you write this? And I got some responses back. Oh, I'm so surprised. What were they? Who are you telling this? But the surprise, most of the responses were, I'm sorry. I was having a bad day. Come on. Really? Were, I had, I would say out of the 10 people that I responded to at some point that responded back to me, mm -hmm. at least half of them were like, I'm so sorry. This was like terrible judgment. It was a mean comment. Can you please delete this? I don't delete it, but, or, or they delete it or something. Yeah. And, but I, I, I've asked people like, why did you write this? And it's been fascinating when people have actually responded back. And then some people like just double down, but that did, but most, most of those responses were, I'm sorry. I was having a bad day. I took this out on you. I don't think people realize that somebody is watching them when they are behind a keyboard. I think there's this anonymity, if that's the right way of saying that word, um, that people assume. And they don't think the subject of who they're criticizing is ever going to see it. And surprise, I read all the comments. I see everything. I might try that. I think that's fascinating. I always just immediately delete because I'm like, you don't get to pollute my space with that nonsense. Um, but I'm, I delete and block. And so I'm really, I'm curious. I might try that. Just send a couple DMs and ask, hey, what had you write that? I'm just, I'm, I'm so surprised people apologized. I mean, that gives me a little more hope for this world that people can have some accountability when they're called out. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. It was, I was definitely not expecting that shit either. So no, no. Kind of building on this theme of, of where, of what you've experienced. When we talk about the intersection of race and size. So you as a black woman, you as a plus size woman, how has that shown up for you? How, like, what's the impact that that has had? How do you 
think about that for yourself, that, that intersectionality. Yeah, it, they definitely go hand in hand. I think in terms of the racial element, um, you know, I talked about sort of my identity with race when I was way, way young in my early life. And now I'm very much in like a racial nirvana situation um, in terms of how I feel about myself. There was a there were times where I felt I wasn't black enough and that because I went to all white schools and I liked, you know, Jagged Little Pills, one of my favorite albums. And I was wearing Birkenstocks and like sweater sets. <laughs> so I I definitely got teased because of that. Um, and I was like, damn, like, am I black enough? But I'm very much comfortable in my blackness at this point. So um, and I'm still playing Jagged Little Pill because it's one of the greatest albums ever created. <laughs> Son of a bitch. Yeah. <laughs> so um <laughs> So that's where I'm at with race. Um, and in terms of fitness, there's not a whole lot of people who look like me in leadership positions. No. And I think when people think of larger black women, it's this idea of Manny comes up. Yeah, that's that trope. Yes, that mammy trope, that kind of like mothering, like someone's in the kitchen, someone's damn good cook, someone who's like very witty, kind of sarcastic, kind of like having to lead everyone. But it's it's interesting because even with that mammy trope, part of mammy's job is to care for everybody and do it. And so in that regard, I do have a big sense of wanting to care for other people and wanting to make sure that they're taken care of. And that kind of, that's the only maternal instincts that I've got, <laughs> you know, but so in that, in that regards, you know, I'm similar, but everything else couldn't be farther from the truth. You know, the fact, I think people are confused. Why would anybody hire me to work in fitness in a capacity because of my size? And I think the confusion becomes from the fitness industry in general. One of the biggest lies that's still perpetuated is that if you're in shape, then you're small. Could you say it again? I just want everyone to hear that one more time, Roz, because this is something that drives me so bananas. It, oh, it's the one of the biggest lies perpetuated by the fitness industry is that to be in shape is the same as to be small. Yeah. Yeah. And so, but in my, in my work as an athlete and also as an instructor, I found that that doesn't always ring true. And people, but people want that to be true. They need that to be true for who knows what reasons. And so here I am blowing up what you think, what you thought was truth. And people, I think in their states of confusion, they don't want to believe. And so they don't. And they make a whole lot of assumptions about myself and my students based on how we look. And, you know, the wild shit um, among the other wild shit is that I don't claim to be in perfect health because I'm not. My blood pressure sucks. My A1C is higher than what it should be. And, well, and, you know, and I'm on medication for some of this. And, you know, it took me a long time to say that out loud. So I'm not even saying I'm in perfect health. I'm not on the other side of the pendulum. I'm literally just existing. And that's what people are confused to the point of anger about. But they can stay big mad because yeah. <laughs> it's very threatening. It's threatening when people are so invested in the idea that health looks like something and 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 again, like that's healthism right there, them assuming all these things about what health looks like. And this thought that somehow like you owe it to them 
to be a certain way. So I love that you just are, that you talk about it. It's like, hey, I'm not in like, and also what the fuck even is perfect health? We don't know what it is like, and we don't owe it to anybody. We get to just, like you said, you get to exist, you get to live in your body and you get to do things that you enjoy and love and create beautiful spaces for other people. Why is that something to be threatened by? But they are. Yeah, people, they they want so badly for my only message to be about weight loss. Mm -hmm. And it's not. And my my message has virtually nothing to do with weight loss. And that's not, as I mentioned before, it's not because I'm anti-weight loss. I'm in favor of it if that's what you want to do. But yeah, it's it's just it's challenging a tired, old, funky ass narrative. Yeah. Yeah. That's being continually propped up and perpetuated by diet culture and commercialism and the pharmaceutical industrial complex. Like, like we can see where it all comes from and why it's so essential that it gets continued for the people who make money off of it. But that means like, how dare you, Roz, a fat black woman, dare to get out there and be seen, be visible, show up? You know, and the crazy thing is I'm not even, when I started out doing fitness, I wasn't starting out to purposely prove a point to anybody or to be an activist or to be an advocate on behalf of plus size people. I just did it because I really liked it. <laughs> I started teaching pole because I really like doing pole. And I was like, oh, snap, let me go teach because it's fun. And it looks like it's dope as hell. The politic got pushed on you, basically. <laughs> oh, 100% got pushed on me. Even still now, like, I would argue, you know, I certainly don't mind being an advocate for plus size people. And and I am for plus size um, athletes, for sure. But it's my, I don't wake up every day thinking, how do I fight? How do I fight the man? I wake up like, I got to go to the fucking gym. All right, what am I going to do with this gym? Oh, look, a butterfly. No, yeah. Roz, you have to go to the gym. <laughs> <laughs> I don't wake up in fight mode all the time. <laughs> yeah, that's probably a good thing. It's exhausting to always be in fight mode. Yeah. Yeah, we at least not about that. I have other there's there's other battles where I'm working on, but I'm not waking up like how do I get back at my trolls? Like I'm not even someone who's motivated by other people saying that I can't. Like I know there's a lot of people that are like, if people tell me I can't, that makes me try two times harder. Or people tell me I can't, I'm like, all right, kind of neutral about it. It doesn't inspire me to do better, to try harder at all. Um, I'm far more inspired by people's positivity. And I think that's also going back to your com your question about trolls and like shitty internet comments. What I try to do is I try to invest my time in people who already give a shit about me. And instead of saying fuck you to the trolls, I take that same time and say thank you to everybody who's been positive and helpful. And from a greedy capitalist perspective, that's gotten me way more money and income and clout is, is gratitude rather than revenge. Yes, yes, yes. That's beautiful, Roz. Yeah, yeah. So, Roz, I know you're, you mentioned when you introduced yourself, what did you say? Aspirational motivational speaker? You said potential or future, future, I think you said? One of the, I forgot which word I used, but all of those can. It was, right? It was a good word. So tell us more about that. Like, where are you wanting to go next? So um, my next iteration is I would like to travel the country slash travel the world um speaking to different audiences i think primarily speaking to other fitness professionals about inclusivity and belonging as it relates to athletics oh yes please i really want 
because I, I know what it's like to feel left out of something because of your size or your ability or your race or whatever have you. And I know the loneliness that comes with that feeling of you can't do this because you're too big or, you, you know, and so I just want to, I don't want other people to feel lonely in the same way that I used to. So I want to speak to other fitness professionals about how they can increase inclusivity and belonging in their businesses. That sounds so incredible and so needed. I don't, I don't think there's a lot of people doing that yet. I mean, I, what I'm, what I have found is that, you know, diversity, equi equity, and inclusion work within organizations. I would say, I mean, I would estimate about 95 to 97% of the time, never talk about size. And so there's just not, even the people who are experts in kind of the DEI field, in the inclusivity conversations, size is being really left out. And there are starting, I'm so grateful, I've had talked to a number of them, and now you too, yay, of people who are like, yeah, no, this needs to be part of the conversation. This needs to be a focus. There's so many things that, you know, I imagine people running fitness organizations like there's so many, there's so much low hanging fruit actually that they could do to make their spaces more inclusive. Do you go in and work with them or you want to like speak from a stage? Like what's your vision? Let's help create this for you. Yeah, I would say both of those things. Um, I've acted as a consultant um, for different pole studios in the past. Um, and I love that work. I mean, and it's, listen, that's, that is a niche on a niche on a niche. But it works for me. So I would love to continue working with different gyms and different athletic facilities about how to make their space both online and offline, make it accessible for people and bring down some of the intimidating factors that people don't even recognize are there, the microaggressions. You know, it's things like if you have towel service, at your gym and if you have showers at your gym can you please get some big ass towels because i can only cover but one butt cheek with your towels i know <laughs> i'm like i have like five towels or like it's same with going to a spa like the robes never close uh, yeah gyms are t and they their towels already kind of feel like they're extra small anyway so it's like literally seven towels draped on my body as I move. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not one of those people that's comfortable despite me being naked on the internet. I'm not just going to roam the gym locker room with my shit all flopping around. <laughs> like I, I would, I would like to be covered as I get dressed. Thank you. And good night. It's, and that's, you know, we're talking about kind of a little thing right now, but that would make a world of difference. And it's again, like you say, it's, it seems like a little thing, but I have talked to so many people who go to a gym or go to a spa, which are where these two kind of towel situations often arise, and they are so harmed because they're embarrassed, they're awkward, they, they, they like never go back because of that. It's, it's such a ridiculous barrier that doesn't need to be there. It doesn't. And this, and to give people the benefit of the doubt, I don't know how many people who have not experienced that kind of shitty feeling that they even know that that's a thing. And, you know, this, so this is, this is where I've been able to be an in-between voice between a straight size and plus size. Cause that's kind of where I live is physically between straight size and plus size. Like I can still shop at Old Navy for most stuff and thank goodness because an old navy clearance rack is deadly for me it's a wrap for you but at the same time i need to get my bras from lane bryant so 
Yeah. Well, that's such an interesting position that you hold because you can be taken, hopefully be taken seriously by the straight size fitness folks and almost like act as like a translator into supporting plus size patrons. Yeah. And, um, and I, I must say one thing, that, another thing that I've learned is that when you make something accessible for one, you make it accessible for everybody because you don't have to be 280 pounds, which is where I'm at right now. You don't have to be 280 pounds to want a big towel when you go to the gym shower. You could be 80 pounds and want to still stay covered. And so if you get, you, again, just using these towels as an example, if you have towels and bathrobes that are good for either end of the spectrum, everybody in between is going to benefit. And that's, that's where I don't think people understand and don't recognize the power of inclusivity work is that it's not just about including that extra one person on the soccer field. It's about that one person's entire family being involved with the team. It's about that entire team now being able to get out to the soccer fields just a little bit easier because they made it just a little bit easier for the one person who's, let's say they were in a wheelchair or they're using some other assistive devices. And that's what I want to hammer home. That's what I want. I think I'm thinking my, my signature keynote right now is about gym intimidation. And it's about different ways that fitness professionals can help their clients move through gym intimidation and how that, how they can function. And, and, you know, not to give the whole thing away, but, you know, another point that I bring up is it's referring to people as athletes, I think is a small thing, but it's a mindset shift. You know, I don't know during this session, I've talked about clients, I've used students, athletes, I use all those words basically interchangeable, but when I can remember to do so, Referring to my peeps as athletes is a really important and powerful thing. Um, there's um, one of my favorite burlesquers, um, Fancy. Um, she has, uh, she's, first of all, she's awesome. She was one of my first personal training clients. And Fancy has, she she told me in or she didn't tell me directly but in an article that she had written she had mentioned that i was the first person in her life to refer to her as an athlete and you know she's someone who was in her mid-30s at that time so it and it made a difference in the work that we were doing and i feel like there's so many there's so much gatekeeping that happens unintentionally and intentionally in some cases. So I just want to kind of open up the gates. Like why let's open those gates that don't need to be locked. Absolutely. Ah, oh, Roz, I see you on the stage. <laughs> I can see it. I can feel it. <laughs> That's what I want. We're shooting for Oprah boy. Oh, can you imagine? Oh my gosh. Oprah would just drop a whole lot of F-bombs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Roz, I always close the conversation asking about joy. So what is your relationship to joy? How do you connect to it? How do you create it? Can you create it? Like, what's your connection to joy? I would say right now, my connection to joy is not strong enough. Um, because I, as an entrepreneur, my job is my life. It's my obsession. It's my boyfriend. It's my partner. It's my sibling. It's when I'm bored, I work. When I'm frustrated, I work. So 
I work has really swooped in to take up a huge emotional plot of land in my mind, in my mind. And so I definitely have joy. Like, let's put that out there. I, I've got some joy, damn it. But I don't have enough of it. And if we're going to keep it all the way real, I'm going to take you on a little apartment tour. I'll show you my sense of joy. Amazing. All right. So for those listening, Roz has picked us up. Oh, and is showing us, ooh, a gorgeous, oh gosh, I don't know my alcohols. Scotch? That's okay. It's yeah. There's scotch. There's whiskey. There's some tequila. Some mezcal. Beautifully, is, beautiful bottles and beautifully organized. Roz, I love oh, the yeah. rose. Everything is organized. It's organized by height. It's organized by. It's a beautiful collection. Thank you. Um, but besides drinking, <laughs> um, I have to say, um, my family is pretty awesome, and they're really amazing. And my sister and I, we have a good time together. She lives across the country in LA. So I don't see her often. I see her maybe a couple times a year. But when we do get together, we do have a really good time together. So, you know, for the times, even though I don't have as much joy as I should, when I am experiencing joy, it's pretty great. Um, I also, because I'm in New York City, that means I enjoy paying for food. And that's basically the only thing that we pay for is food and rent. And I love going out to dinner. I love the culture of food. I like trying new foods. I like trying new flavors of ice cream. I really, I really love it. And that's sort of kind of how I recharge and unwind a little bit is to sit at a restaurant for three hours and, you know, just kind of catch up with some friends. And so I like that. And then besides that, um, I really, really like African dance. And I've been taking African dance classes for a few years now with this gentleman, Maget Kamara. And I swear this dude like invented Senegal. Um, and um, I am not very good all the time because I forget the choreography in class. And it is not, sometimes I also, the class is a little more advanced than my skill set, but I just have a good time dancing to live drummers. They're just, they, once they get going is just take me back to the motherland right there. It's, it's pretty awesome. So when I do that class, I usually, I try to get to it once a week, but I would say it ends up being like twice a month. I'm able to get to African dance. It's a really good time. So I would say that's, those are my kind of top places of joy. Oh, it's beautiful. Beautiful, Roz. And now I want ice cream and to listen to some drumbeat music. Roz, this has been a joy. I have loved getting to know you and I'm very inspired by what you do in the world and what your vision is for what you want to do even more of. So thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you, Sophia, for, give, for giving me this platform. Thank you for letting me, my heart speak. I am so appreciative of it and of people like you. So you're doing a lot of awesome work too. Mm, thank you. Before we go, I'd like to read a poem because poetry can reach our hearts in a different way. Poems can have us feel in a different way. And that's what this podcast is all about. Expanding our hearts, deepening our empathy, and inviting in joy. So each week, you get a new poem. For this episode with Roz the Diva, I chose the poem, God Says Yes to Me. I love the humor and irreverence of this poem, and it reminds me of both the joy and questioning that Roz exudes. This poem is written by Kaylin Hott. I asked God if it was okay to be melodramatic, and she said yes. I asked her if it was okay to be short, and she said it sure is. I asked her if I could wear nail polish or not wear nail polish. She said, honey, 
She calls me that sometimes. She said, you can do just exactly what you want to do. Thanks, God, I said. And is it even okay if I don't paragraph my letters? Sweet cakes, God said. Who knows where she picked that up? What I'm telling you is yes, yes, yes. Thank you for joining me today. My hope is that you're feeling a little less alone and a little more seen. So until the next episode, you can find me on Instagram at fatjoy.life, on YouTube at youtube.com slash at fatjoy, and on Substack at fatjoy.substack.com. And please do check out the episode notes for how you can connect with my amazing guest and for the links to the poem. All right, lovely. I am sending you off with my best wishes for an abundantly fat joy day. And we'll talk again soon.